historian. He has taught at the University of Kansas as well as the University of the Philippines, Baker University, and the University of Hong Kong, and the University of Kentucky. Dennis retired from the university and from his distinguished professorship in 2006, but that was not when we'd seen the last of him because you went on to be the director of museum studies and what else? American studies. American studies, museum studies, and then um, also began leading the New Cities Initiative. Um, and this is a, this is a very interesting uh, story, and, and if I'm stepping on the creation story, let me just go back briefly. There was some philanthropy to the university in 2010. Uh, real estate, local real estate developer wanted to begin to uh, build retirement housing and he wanted, he gave some money to the School of Architecture and Dennis ended up leading this effort on um, what should the, the next generation of retirement communities or, or senior housing be like. And it kicked off a rolling discussion that it's gone on for years now. It's involved graduate seminars, design studios, distinguished speakers have come in to talk about this, and it's also spawned off a number of initiatives. It's been very exciting and energizing for the university, the New Cities group. Now, it also kind of led to a new, a, one of the initiatives, and that's what we're going to hear about today, uh, and a, a KU-affiliated retirement community, and I said it, there's going to be more to it than just retirees. Um, we're, we're hoping, but I did it out of an interest in gerontology. About 12 years ago, um, uh, people from the gerontology center went to the chancellor of the university and said, we ought to build a re university affiliated retirement community. And um, they were told, well, this isn't the time. So about five years ago, uh, we made another sally, we made another run at university officials. We ought to build a university affiliated retirement community. Well, this is not the time. We're doing something else. We got other things going on. Now, the next time around is the new cities people um, begin to mention this idea, and then finally it gets traction. Uh, the idea of a university affiliated retirement community, which actually turned into something more. And Dennis is going to bring us up to date on the the vision of this and the reality of this. I've been for the last two years, I think, asking, is it gas or liquid or solid? Where are we in the in the specificity of this thing? So. Um, and, it, and it changes week to week, so let's see what, what's new. It does, it does change week to week, and it's very interesting because we never know what's going to happen next, which I think probably means that it's a growing living organism. But we have, I, I, this is my fourth year in the New Cities Initiative, and primarily the New Cities Initiative is the university attempt to, and my attempt to inform myself uh, about your field of gerontology as it relates to architecture. Look at this stepchild of gerontology, architecture, and to see whether or not um, there might be a, some boomer futures here that ordinarily uh, we wouldn't be uh, expecting. Uh, I said here, a campus village for KU, where we are and how we got here, just to begin by saying we are right on the precipice of doing this. I mean, we are right this close. And this all depends on you now. All of it depends on you, and I will get to that, but uh, it always gets down to faculty and students, who, after all, hold the most power if they know how to use it. Uh, and so um, I'm going to try to describe eventually uh, where we are today, which is we're ready. But mostly I'm going to talk to you how we got here. Because just, and I'm going to show you a kind of documentation of this process. Uh, and I'm going to try to do this fairly quickly so that you can get into a, a conversation with me because it's very interesting and I can't cover everything. It's very complicated. Um, this really begins uh, after New Cities got started. This really begins in earnest when uh, I was asked to come down and talk to the County and Cities Retiree Attraction and uh, Retention Task Force, Rosemary. And I came down and gave a talk about this university-related intergenerational community idea. 
And I'm not going to talk about intergenerationality or anything like that. Assuming you know about the boomers and all that, we can come back to it. But I came down and gave a talk to first the subcommittee on housing, and then to the full committee. I could tell that that uh, task force was looking for uh, something to get a hold of. And I presented this university-related uh, intergenerational community, and it caught fire right there. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Why does Douglas County or the city of Lawrence want to attract retirees? This is a college money. town. Money. 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 They have money. Money <laughs> makes the world go around. Right? It's, it's money. Well, I, it isn't I, just money. It's not just <laughs> money. But the Chamber of Commerce wants to have a economic development here. And then there are other people on that committee who have lots of other reasons for it, right? I, I need to say that there was a committee, the Douglas County Coalition on Aging, that's been working for about five years on this idea. And we finally w were able to influence the, uh, the city and county to develop that retiree attraction in the kitchen task force uh, precisely because we were not only uh, interested in attracting more retirees, which we were, yeah. but also retaining them. And, and we felt like it was a good, as you say, money makes the world go round. There's, uh, there's always many things that drive social policy. Yeah, that's right. We it isn't just money, it. but that is a big driver here. And it only works if everybody makes money. You can't get any kind of thing built or uh, survive unless people make money. That's just a ground rule. But thank God there are other motivations. As it turned out, when all of this material came in, it had to be written up in a report, and Rosemary didn't have time to do it, so... And they, I recommended the And she recommended me, and so <laughs> over the weekend, because when we first went to look at this report, the English professors were just flipped out. It was full of passive voices, you know, all that stuff that you get graded on. And it was just wild, so I agreed to turn it into English, and they made me the senior editor. I wondered who are the junior editors here. But I basically <laughs> just rewrote it. It wasn't that difficult. It took the weekend to do. And because I was the senior editor, next one, I put in uh, what I thought they wanted, and that was the city and the county should work with the University of Kansas alumni, endowment, private sector, and other appropriate stakeholders to establish this intergenerational long life community with diverse housing options and warrants. I got into a, I think it was called a, was an immediate goal, but it was a near-term goal. And there it was. Now, it just happens that we have bold aspirations at KU. I hope uh, ours is not too bold for bold aspirations, but I realized that this need to have a kind of living laboratory for KU researchers, faculty, and students was a great way to embody engaged scholarship, which was one of the bold aspirations, to build community, to be an engaged scholarship, to make a difference in our world, because it was, I, just, I don't have to talk to you about, our world as an aging place. So I considered it to be a perfect fit for bold aspirations and I got right in on it and I went to every meeting and um, I knew that I would have to work with Jeff Vitter on this city county proposal and I made friends with Jeff. I walked across the campus with him and talked to him. Actually he was very easy to talk to and sense. So I thought that we could do this what you tried to do 12 years ago and five years ago now is the time a bold aspirations. And so what did I do? I set up a meeting with Jeff Vitter and Hugh Carter from the chamber. And clarifying for Jeff Vitter is basically the provost. And the provost. He runs the campus. He runs the campus. He's the executive We have a chancellor, but too. it's over the whole university, but he runs this campus. Yeah. So, I set up, <coughs> yeah. so I set up a meeting with him and that was in August of 2012, and I spent a lot of time building something that I could hand to him. Basically, they were talking points. Because there's a guy, if you hand it to him right, you can have an effect. But if you don't, right off, it's gone. So, 
I set it up saying, look, these are the reasons why you should consider this, Jeff. Number one, the KU Alumni Association of over 10,000 people said that Lawrence was a good place to retire, basically. There are some problems, but a good place to retire, especially because education is a key component for boomers. And uh, KU is a university, is a, Lawrence is obviously a university town, and there are over 50 to 60 university related communities of various sorts across the country. It's a very hot place, so next one. Education was a key component. And, let's see, could you go to the next one? There we go. And the intergenerational community idea was something that caught fire because people could relate to that. Uh, and in the university town, it's a prime place to develop intergenerational relationships. Next. And um, people who come to a place like Lawrence to retire, who are KU alumni, tend to give money to the endowment. So I'm looking for ways to get him to see that this has a lot of dimensions. And back to money. Like um, uh, Oak Hammock in Florida, over at the end of six or seven years, those people had already given uh, $18 million to the endowment. And I could show that. You know, Vitter is very evidence-based, and that's how I like to work, and I just decided I will lay down evidence for him. Um, and part of the way in which I laid down evidence is that I studied about 10 or 12 university-related communities, particularly MU, because MU was very successful in a uh, partnership with a for-profit developer, and at this point, they had attracted about $50 million worth of research grants from NIH and particularly the National Science Foundation. They said because of this living laboratory, basically, that they have there, which I'm not going to go into. But people tend to give money. But I really focused in on research because that's what Vitter is interested in. How can we move this university forward on research? And I said that this intergenerational community would provide the kind of laboratory that gerontologists from various fields had been missing. We'd had it in the Lifespan Institute for early, but not for late in the lifespan, and why not? Next. And I went back to Tiger Place and I laid down all the evidence for it, just like that. Uh, and I said this association will encourage university faculty to stay here and retire. Next. And I said that this intergenerational community through KU's Living Laboratory would develop research that serves Kansas, the nation, and the world, and otherwise engage scholarship. It was really clear. Next. And uh, I said that we could bring lots of departments together, including the Med Center, which had been in a state of enmity with uh, Lawrence for years. If we could bring them together around this intergenerational problem and this interdisciplinary problem. We couldn't just work on it from one perspective, but we could actually bring these molecules together in a different way and galvanize our resources and sort of have a new future for uh, research. Next. So uh, I investigated all these schools and laid that out. That was in August. Next, in September, I got this nice little letter from Jeff Vitter. And this is a very positive letter. I'm not sure you can see it, but he said he enjoyed the meeting. By the way, at the end of the meeting, he said, this is a win-win for everyone. I said, okay, we got in. And he sends us a little letter to us and he says, uh, what do you want from us? How much is it gonna cost us? Uh, you know, all these things that would suggest that he was really interested, he was convinced. Uh, and so that's just what I needed to then go on. And what I needed to do immediately then was to get the institutions together that were going to be involved. Who was gonna be involved? The city, the county, the hospital, the school district, and the university. How can you get those 
uh, institutions together and come together. Particularly when the chancellor, by the way, before I got to this, we had a meeting with the chancellor, with the provost, with the president of the endowment association, and with the president of the alumni association. We sat up there for an hour talking to her, and she liked it. Uh, so I realized that I had to put something together that was besides Dennis Domer, because basically I'd been doing this on my own authority. Why not? That's the best authority there why is, Dennis. <laughs> why, why not? <laughs> Don't I look like I'm an authority in something? Maybe not. Maybe eating. Uh, uh, so, and the key was that it had to be outside of Dennis Domer because the university could not relate directly to for-profit groups. So we had to figure out a way for the university to do this without a direct relationship. And by talking to uh, our experts in uh, uh, governance of retirement communities, we learned that what normally you have is a governance system and a governance board. And the governance board has appointment authority, has approval authority, is in strategic decision-making processes, uh, uses this influence, talks to the right people, but doesn't have any money because nobody can sue you. And the key was that nobody could sue KU if it affiliated with us. And if the not-for-profit board of directors, which we would appoint, affiliated with us, and if the hospital, county, city, etc., all affiliated with this governance board, then we would be the in-between mechanism to uh, negotiate all this stuff for the university. That's what the university wanted. So I set up a governance board. I went around. Oops, go back. What did we lose here? Back. Hmm. I lost it. Go That's forward. Weird. I don't know. Go backwards. Go the other way. Well, anyway, I thought I had the governance board there. I had 15 people. I don't know what's happened here. Uh, because I wasn't ready for the vision. Anyway, I, I, maybe it'll come up somewhere. It's very strange down here in computing. I went around to different people in the city who I considered to be pivotal leaders. And I convinced every one of them to join this board because of this vision. And who was it? David Ambler. Uh, he was a retired vice uh, chancellor for student affairs. I had the president of the Lawrence Memorial Hospital. I had the superintendent of schools. I had the dean of architecture, the dean of nursing. I had a distinguished professor of psychology, one of your midst. Uh, I had several other people from the university. I had a president of Intrust Bank. I had a realtor. I had uh, a county commissioner, Jim Flory, and a city commissioner, Terry Reardon, who's also a pediatrician. Uh, and so, 15 people that you could bet that if the university looked at, they would have to take them seriously. In order to get them, I had to develop a vision. Now, uh, the visionary. The visionary goes around and says, well, what do you think? And 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 you put it together, and suddenly they say, Dennis Domer is the visionary. I'm not the visionary. I'm the synthesizer, really. And what I did was to sh convince them that an intergenerational community was the next innovation, that Lawrence could be the place for it, that KU was on board, because nobody would do this unless KU is on board. KU was the key article here. And so, go ahead, next. I, why are we creating the village? Why, uh, who's the community for? Community basically is for middle class people with some attention to uh, low income people through tennis to homeowners and others because the city and the county needed that to work politically. And by the way, this is all really political, all of this. And so, um, next, getting down to, this is about an eight page document, I got down to the educational components, the kinds of things that you are looking for and how that living laboratory, KU, would maybe function there. And that all made sense to everyone, so on we go, next. 
Here it is. Here's our board. I guess I put it behind instead of front. Here's the board. So it's a really top board in the city. And people will take it seriously. And we've met six or seven times. We're meeting tomorrow again. So we can see that uh, if I get these kinds of people here, then the university is going to say, yeah, this is a legitimate group of people to work with. And uh, they're powerful in the city. And uh, they mean business. Next. And we did mean business. So in order for me to get the university to take one step further, what did Jeff Vitter want? He said, well, tell me who would participate in the living laboratory. And what do they want? Uh, and so uh, Susan Kemper and I spent a while going around to you folks uh, through the university, at least to a certain extent, and we collected all of these people, and I'm not saying that we actually have everyone. Probably there are people who aren't there who should be there. In any case, we collected all this material, next, and then I began to lay out the design and uh, programming components for them. In other words, if you, Amber, need something, what is it you need, and how does the architect understand that? What is the space? Uh, what are its characteristics? Um, what are the fixtures that you need? What's the size? And what's your future? You know, are you going to get three times as big, or are you going to just stay where you are? And that is kind of an architectural program. Uh, we talked a lot about different considerations. Next, please. But here's an example of the cognition suite. This is the kind of detail that the architect needs uh, in order to begin. And uh, that is sort of a beginning description. Uh, we're not done with this yet. But that was enough to get the provost and the chancellor uh, in the position of saying, well, maybe they do want to do this. Because the question is always, they say they want to do it, but will they? Right? That's always the question because KU, like all educational institutions of KU sort, is a very fickle institution. What do I mean by that? Well, the provost could be gone in the next three months. You know, the chancellor might leave. The deans might be changed. Uh, the faculty might leave. This, everything can change, so it's very hard to nail the university down. And that was one of my biggest worries. Would the university deliver? And that was one of the worries that Jeff Fitter had. Next. Well, after all of that, the university about six months ago said, you know, I think we really want to do this. And so I'm going to go to the lawyers. Jeff Fitter says, I'll go to our lawyers, and we're going to develop a so-called memorandum of intent to affiliate with this campus village board. And this memorandum of intent basically said, um, we will deliver all these faculty and students and uh, research projects out there if you, the developer, or you, the Campus Village Board, will work with the developer to give us all this space free. <laughs> free. Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? I mean, isn't this just the way the university is? <laughs> you know, the return on investment normally takes an investment but the university doesn't want to invest, it just wants the return, and that's what it got. It basically got the return. Because the developer can see, and Moody suggests, that if you get this affiliation with the university, your chances of succeeding in any building project go up to 60, 70, 80 percent. It's all about credibility, association, rock, chalk, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> You know, it really, it gets down to that gut, gut emotional thing. So uh, that was the MOI. This was the first one about six months ago, which the chancellor signed. Then when I began to talk to them a little bit more about what it meant, they took the MOI back and said, we got to uh, put in some more defense clauses. Because what the university did not want to do, did not want to have any financial liability, and it didn't want any legal liability. And that's why it was affiliating with the Campus Village Board, because we were to protect them from all of that. They took it back, 
And then they gave us a second MOI with, you know, some more defense mechanisms in. Okay, it's normal. Expect that. Didn't bother us. So we had this uh, intent to affiliate. Looks good. Go ahead. Next. And what did the developers do? They said, okay, then we will affiliate too. And here's a memorandum of understanding that we're going to write between us and the Campus Village Board. And basically what the memorandum of understanding said, we the developers will deliver this space and all these things if you, the Campus Village Board, will work to achieve these number of things. One was the association with KU was really that funny bird with yellow feet. You know, we call this Jayhawk thing or a rock chalk thing or something. I, or what I liked was just, if we had to have it, we could just do that walking KU, you know, the, the foot out. That's the all I wanted uh, because that was enough. So uh, we've worked through this and we found some issues that we had to eliminate. For example, uh, KU um, can't directly connect to a developer and there was something in there that they thought was uh, referred to that so we had to take those kinds of things out. But basically it was just fine. We could handle it all. Next. Here's what the developer really wanted. And when we sat down with the provost and his entourage about a week and a half ago and we got down to brass tacks, <clears throat> The developer said, yeah, this is what we'll take. Because <clears throat> I already told him we can't have any Jayhawk out there. We can't have any Rock Chalk Village. You know, let's not be cheesy now. And besides, we don't want just people who are Rock Chalk totally red and blue. We don't want just those kinds of people. We might want people who graduated from K-State or from Baker or from Haskell or whatever. <clears throat> now, Sounds like everything's going pretty well, right? Moving really fast, in fact, pretty fast because we got a developer, Lane Ford Property Group out of Kansas City. We have a 60 acre site. We are down to selecting an architect and a master planner. And um, we're sitting down with the university with the provost saying, okay, what do you guys want? I'm sitting here with the developer. I'm now considered, by the way, to be impure. I can't speak for the university because I'm a booster, you know, I'm impure now. I've worked here for 35 years. I think, well, who is pure in this uh, place? But I can't speak for the university so I can sit with the developer and be across the table from the provost and negotiate with him. Well, in that last meeting, they said, you know what? We made a mistake, a procedural mistake. We can't do an MOI with you without doing an RFP and going out for, they said, for a developer. I said, no, you're, you don't have the right to select the developer. That's the campus village and we're not ceding our right to you to go find a developer, to find a site, to find an architect. You have the right to affiliate with us, but that's it. And I said, if you want to, hi Billy, if you want to go out for an RFP, what you have to do is to go out for a not-for-profit governing board like I have. And uh, you can ask for other things, like you can say, look, here's exactly what we want now, which I have to do. I have to go around to Dean's one more time and get it down. This is why I'm saying it's up to you. Um, exactly what we want, but we might ask not only for a not-for-profit board, which people are going to say, okay, is crazy again, not-for-profit board, maybe they'd ask for the fulfillment of KU's needs, living laboratory, they might say, come with a developer who's ready to do it, come with a developer who's got a site, come with a master plan that we can look at. Who else is going to do this? Maybe somebody. But I think that they're going to have a hard time putting together that kind of board. And they're going to have a hard time putting together, a, finding a developer and site. All that's possible. The problem is, is that 
that delays everything six months because I have to go back now and get the architectural uh, program. I have to go sit down with the deans and say, you're dean, I have to say, well, dean Anderson, this is what Amber wants. Watts wants, are you sure she wants it? And is her department going to allocate her time to do it? And if we build you a lab, or build you a lab, will you be able to use it? Will you go do it? And will you commit to it? Because the provost is so serious now that he sees the real problem. Will KU deliver? That's the problem. And if the developer builds all this space and KU doesn't deliver, that's where we're going to have difficulty. Of course, the fact that the university said, oh, we want to put an RFP, that was music to the ears of our developer because now they have somebody to sue. They couldn't sue the campus village because we were there with no money and we were just uh, the governing board, which everybody agreed to our power to govern if they affiliated. Now the developer says, if this screws up, I don't know where to go because KU has money and the Campus Village Board intentionally would never have a penny. Interesting. And in my meeting with the lawyers then the next time I said, look, you guys can, can't just go out for a developer because you can't just get a developer for this KU Living Laboratory. That's part of a bigger place. And no developer, by the way, is going to just do the KU Living Laboratory for free because what is she going to get out of it? You know, it's like, I have to say this. The university doesn't always get things straight. Well, it was always backing off and now they're going to go out, presumably for a campus village board in six months. Now, what did I think? Oh, God. We're going to lose the developer. We're going to lose the site. And we won't have anything then just because of this ridiculous thing. Well, I talked to the developer. It didn't bother him at all. Because there are other things going on that I can't really tell you, but there's more than one site. Maybe just as good. Maybe even better. And maybe the time uh, lapse actually helps rather than hurts. It's a very complicated process. You never know whether you've, you're on a speed bump, a blip, or whether you've run into a wall until, you know, I thought I had run into a wall with a developer and I was going to lose everything. I thought maybe I'd run into the wall with the, with the provost when I said, we're not going to give you the right to select uh, anything but us and if you're going to affiliate. Didn't bother him either. So we're at this point where the university is extremely serious. It wants to do this, but it doesn't want to do it, David, unless you are real and that you are going to do it. And if we build a, some sort of lab for you out there, you won't say, uh, it's not my problem anymore. I'm working on something else, right? So that's the issue is whether or not the, the developer is going to get what he needs, which is just this. That's all he needs. If you give him that. Now, there was one other thing that the developer really wanted from the university that we tussled about, and that was the transportation link between the Lawrence campus and that campus. Now, the KU city bus system already goes out there within three quarters of a mile. You know that this site is out on 6th Street you know about the site, so we could look at that later, but it's out on 6th Street. It's within three quarters of a mile, and it's contiguous, the site is contiguous to the Rock Chalk Park, so there's going to be a lot of need for connection. Well, the lawyer said, oh, we'll let the city do that, and I said, oh, no, you can't just let the city do this. You know, this would suggest you're not serious. Well, in our meeting, the provost came around to that one. That was obvious, too. So basically, we've maneuvered, we continue to maneuver around various problems and uh, solve them as we go along and never give up and always be positive and not be afraid to tell them what is really necessary. Don't, don't say, well, I can't say this to the provost because whatever. Say it. Say it. Do it. 
And uh, he respects that. Not that you're going to be disrespectful, that you do anything like that, but you lay it on the line so he gets it. And that's what really helps. Okay. So what are what the uh, so they're going to build a campus? There's going to be a there's a campus. You're going to be there's going to be housing for people. Yeah, about 300 Is units. About 300 uh, housing units. Mostly independent uh, living. Not not that it's actually in set in stone, but the division of it. Well, the business school looked at this and said we could do compared to our site to other university sites and what's all around it. They did some analysis that said we could do 600 units. I didn't really understand their analysis. How they got to 600, it didn't make that much sense to me. Uh, and is, so then is KU getting a, a KU is going to get a, a get. KU would like to have a building there, uh, a wing of an apartment house, uh, a what? A what, 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 are, what are we? We're just calling it a living laboratory. And it, it may be centralized, it might be decentralized, it, depending on how you want it. The same thing goes for the kinds of services that we have suggested we might want in a community like this. Far be it for me, Rosemary, to even mention CCRC, but I mention it only that those kinds of services that you find in a CCRC might be available here, but I don't think it'll be an agglomerated building. It should be a decentralized uh, service um, operation. So will KU get a building? I think KU will get space. It might get part of a building. I don't know whether it'll get a whole building or not. Will there be good parking? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about health, so we're going to ask you to walk, okay? Walk the five miles back and forth, it'll be fine. Right, right. So, so um, it will be independent living, assisted living. It will be uh, a landscape that enhances intergenerational exchange. It will be a landscape that has certainly destinations. It will attempt to um, uh, offer services that will bring people in to use those services, not just people who live there. For example, the hospital is studying a health satellite. In a health satellite, they might have a pediatrician who would come, or an orthopedic uh, doctor who would come, or uh, nurses who would work there, uh, in order to respond to the needs of younger families. So, Dennis, do I understand then that the land hasn't been purchased or tied up? We're just still talking about a hospital site. Huh? Until the university decided that it made a procedural error, the land was going to be purchased tomorrow. Oh, okay. That was the last date for it to be purchased, was tomorrow, the 60 acres. Now, it doesn't have to be purchased tomorrow, and a developer isn't going to purchase it yet. Because now there might be other sites that he could purchase. So, again, it's these questions that you handle all the time, and it's a risk. And you just play the strongest hand you can. At least that's how I do it. Richard? I don't quite understand the, the university's point of view. If you build a facility, whether it's a, a part of a building or if it's laboratories or space in which various people can carry out research. Uh, I, I don't see the problem because the university has the power if somebody who's already here says, oh, I don't want to do research out there, the university can go hire somebody who will do research out there easily enough. The, the provost has that a power. He can, know, and, oh, I, he can so, but so. I don't think he has those resources. This is no time for him to be spending resources that he doesn't have. And he, believe me, he doesn't have the resources he had in 2005. And he's worried about resources. When you sit across from him, he says to you, you know, the one thing I can't do is build space. I don't have money to build space. I have to raise money for that and I know you need it, and if somebody will give us the space, 
then I can pay for the uh, utilities and if your lab needs certain kinds of laboratory equipment, if we decide that's what we want to do, we can furnish that laboratory space as long as it has the right infrastructure for what you need. And I can sort of develop a new approach to research around gerontology and I can compete with MU, for example. We have other things in which we're not going to compete with MU, we're going to work with MU. So, you, yes, he does have that power, but he doesn't have the money to do it, to get put new faculty there, unless he has to reallocate away from pharmacy, which he's not going to do, and he doesn't have the money to build your space, or your space, the decision-making center, he says, but if they build it for me, I can move faculty out there. That's what he said. Now he sees, good idea, but can I move faculty out there? I've got to go talk to your dean. And your dean has to say to your chair and with your faculty who supposedly are interested, okay, is that where you're going to do your teaching? Is that where you're going to do your research? Uh, how much time are you going to spend out there? Because I have to commit to the provost that you're going to do it. What's the advantage of having the uh, research? Is it out there? I mean, what would happen if KU said, we're not going to have the research out there, but you can use our logo? I mean, is, that, is the research itself the draw for the retirees? Nope. No. Okay, so that's, I mean, no. KU can, can no. do it or not. I don't that's know right. That's, that's, what the, that's what the developer says. He says, look, as long as you give me that, I don't care if you come at all. Right. Right. But mm -hmm. why would you get that if you weren't going to be there? Right. So the other thing is, is that why is it that MU has created so much research. From their perspective, it's because they have a real living laboratory and they have lots of participants. I used to call them subjects, but I've been told that that's not right anymore. <laughs> participants. They have lots of participants. And we need participants. That's one of the hardest things that we have to face with our faculty is they can't get enough in, you know, mm -hmm. the statistic, to, to be able to do a statistical analysis that they can uh, actually make a contribution. Unless you want to study college sophomores, in which case we have lots. We got of lots of college sophomores. And we don't, we don't really have this intergenerational equation going anywhere else in the country, so we're very interested in that generativity between generations that uh, some research suggests that uh, might be really important. Yes? Dennis, I understand that you have many pressing issues, <laughs> and, I, and I say this over and over, I'm going to say it one more time. Our dream, when the uh, aging providers in town were talking about this for years and years, was not more assisted living, more independent living, but rather architectural space where you could bring services in and a person could live until death. And that kind mm -hmm. of architectural space done with universal housing design then yep. is good space for everybody. It's good space for yep. younger people, older people. So every time I hear you say assisted living and independent living. But that know, doesn't so obviate that. That doesn't obviate that. Mm -hmm. Assisted living, if you have an aging in place uh, can be architecture, can in, be service. Not a yes. building that's called assisted living. Well, that's not what I said. It's, I didn't say a building. I said decentralized. But somebody, it will have to be some kind of building. They can't just live in a tent. You know <laughs> no, that. But it's, but it's not going to be in a, an agglomerated un place. Universal housing design that services. That's right. It's, we don't want it to be an agglomerated, typical CCRC that we see. The first generation that we have here. Presbyterian Manor and those first generation CCRCs, that's not what we're looking at. We're not even looking at second generation CCRCs. We're looking at decentralized uh, services for people who need assisted living, if they're there, always in a universally designed place so that they can age in place until they die. So they don't have to move each time they have a, a crisis that would like my mother, she started with independent living, then she went to assisted living, and now she's in skilled nursing, but she doesn't need skilled nursing. But that's all there is. So, no, you're right, we're, we're right on target with that. We don't foresee it being a single building, like memory care. We expect memory care to be in regular houses scattered throughout this community. 
I would think that certainly independent living could be in all over, and so could assisted living. Uh, and now skilled nursing is a big issue. Uh, do we really want skilled nursing? It's very regulated, it's very expensive, states don't, are not willing to pay for it anymore, it's sort of against their policy. And we have skilled nursing throughout our community that may be all that's necessary for our community. Maybe we shouldn't offer that service. Although Brandon Woods is cutting their skilled nursing by about a third. So that's an issue. Another issue just to come up with that, and I'm glad to see you here, Debbie, is that I've been meeting with a lot of the skilled, uh, the senior facilities uh, administrators in Lawrence. I met with them twice and I visited every one of them. Initially, there was pushback. Like, why wouldn't there be pushback? This might be competition. They were worried that somehow we might steal all of their residences, residents. Really, competition is there, but I don't think that was the real issue. The real issue was that they wanted to be part of this. And I hadn't paid enough attention to them. It's not that I didn't have anything else to do, but I hadn't paid attention to them enough. And once I started meeting with them and talking to them, all of this, wouldn't you say, Debbie, it, it more or less just sort of... I would say 85% has... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to bite my tongue a lot in meetings. Um, yeah. But uh, we just want to make sure that full knowledge mm -hmm. is gained before there's advancement. Yeah. So there's a political front out there in Lawrence. There's a political front in KU because there are ideologies in KU. There's administrative issues. Um, there are po politics with the owner of the land, politics with the city and the county, politics with everybody. And so I'm just working through the political aspects of it and as I learn more and more, I move it in that direction and now the developer is talking about decentralized service. He uses that funny bird with yellow feet, you know, we call this Jayhawk thing or a rock chalk thing or something. I, or what I like was just, if we had to have it, we could just do that walking KU, you know, the, the foot out. That's the all I wanted uh, because that was enough. So uh, we've worked through this and we found some issues that we had to eliminate. For example, uh, KU um, can't directly connect to a developer and there was something in there that they thought was uh, referred to that so we had to take those kinds of things out. But basically, it was just fine. We could handle it all. Next. Here's what the developer really wanted. And when we sat down with the provost and his entourage about a week and a half ago and we got down to brass tacks, <clears throat> the developer said, yeah, this is what we'll take. Because <clears throat> I already told him we can't have any Jayhawk out there. We can't have any Rock Chalk Village, you know. Let's not be cheesy now. And besides, we don't want just people who are rock chalk, totally red and blue. We don't want just those kinds of people. We might want people who graduated from K-State or from Baker or from Haskell or whatever. <clears throat> now, sounds like everything's going pretty well, right? Moving really fast. In fact, pretty fast because we got a developer, Lane Ford Property Group out of Kansas City. We have a 60-acre site. We are down to selecting an architect and a master planner. And um, we're sitting down with the university with the provost saying, OK, what do you guys want? I'm sitting here with the developer. I'm now considered, by the way, to be impure. I can't speak for the university because I'm a booster. You know, I'm impure now. I've worked here for 35 years. I think, well, who is pure in this uh, place? But, I can't speak for the university, so I can sit with the developer and be across the table from the provost and negotiate with him. Well, in that last meeting, they said, you know what? We made a mistake, a procedural mistake. We can't do an MOI with you without doing an RFP and going out for, they said, for a developer. I said, 
no, you're, you don't have the right to select the developer. That's the campus village, and we're not ceding our right to you to go find a developer, to find a site, to find an architect. You have the right to affiliate with us, but that's it. And I said, if you want to, hi Billy, if you want to go out for an RFP, what you have to do is to go out for a not-for-profit governing board like I have. And uh, you can ask for other things, like you can say, look, here's exactly what we want now, which I have to do. I have to go around to Dean's one more time and get it down. This is why I'm saying it's up to you. Um, exactly what we want, but we might ask not only for a not-for-profit board, which people are going to say, okay, is crazy again, not-for-profit board, maybe they'd ask for the fulfillment of KU's needs, living laboratory, they might say, come with a developer who's ready to do it, come with a developer who's got a site, come with a master plan that we can look at. Who else is going to do this? Maybe somebody. But I think that they're going to have a hard time putting together that kind of board. And they're going to have a hard time putting together a, finding a developer and site. All that's possible. The problem is, is that that delays everything six months because I have to go back now and get the architectural uh, program. I have to go sit down with the deans and say, you're dean, I have to say, well, dean Anderson, this is what Amber wants, Watts wants. Are you sure she wants it? And uh, is her department going to allocate her time to do it? And if we build you a lab or build you a lab, will you be able to use it, will you go do it, and will you commit to it? Because the provost is so serious now that he sees the real problem. Will KU deliver? That's the problem. And if the developer builds all this space and KU doesn't deliver, that's where we're going to have difficulty. Of course, the fact that the university said, oh, we want to put an RFP, that was music to the ears of our developer because now they have somebody to sue. They couldn't sue the campus village because we were there with no money and we were just uh, the governing board, which everybody agreed to our power to govern if they affiliated. Now the developer says, if this screws up, I'll know where to go because KU has money and the campus village board intentionally would never have a penny. Interesting. And in my meeting with the lawyers, then the next time I said, look, you guys can, can't just go out for a developer because you can't just get a developer for this KU Living Laboratory. That's part of a bigger place. And no developer, by the way, is going to just do the KU Living Laboratory for free because what is she going to get out of it? You know, it's like, I have to say this. The university doesn't always get things straight. Well. It was always backing off, and now they're going to go out, presumably, for a campus village board in six months. Now, what did I think? Oh, God. We're going to lose the developer. We're going to lose the site, and we won't have anything then just because of this ridiculous thing. Well, I talked to the developer. Didn't bother him at all because there are other things going on that I can't really tell you, but there's more than one side. Maybe just as good, maybe even better. And maybe the time uh, lapse actually helps rather than hurts. It's a very complicated process. You never know whether you've, you're on a speed bump, a blip, or whether you've run into a wall until, you know, I thought I had run into a wall with a developer and I was going to lose everything. I thought maybe I'd run into the wall with the, with the provost when I said, we're not going to give you the right to select uh, anything but us and if you're going to affiliate. Didn't bother him either. So we're at this point where the university is extremely serious. It wants to do this, but it doesn't want to do it, David, unless you are real and that you are going to do it. And if we build a, some sort of lab for you out there, 
you won't say, uh, it's not my problem anymore, I'm working on something else, right? So that's the issue, is whether or not the, the developer is going to get what he needs, which is just this. That's all he needs. If you give him that. Now, there was one other thing that the developer really wanted from the university that we tussled about, and that was the transportation link between the Lawrence campus and that campus. Now, the KU city bus system already goes out there within three quarters of a mile. You know that this side is out on 6th Street. You know about the side, so we could look at that later, but it's out on 6th Street. It's within three quarters of a mile, and it's contiguous, the site is contiguous to the Rock Chalk Park. So there's going to be a lot of need for connection. Well, the lawyer said, oh, we'll let the city do that. And I said, oh, no, you can't just let the city do this. You know, this would suggest you're not serious. Well, in our meeting, the provost came around to that one. That was obvious, too. So basically, we've maneuvered. We continue to maneuver around various problems and uh, solve them as we go along. and never give up and always be positive and not be afraid to tell them what is really necessary. Don't, don't say, well, I can't say this to the provost because whatever. Say it. <laughs> say it. Do it. And uh, he respects that. Not that you're going to be disrespectful, that you do anything like that, but you lay it on the line so he gets it. And that's what really helps. Okay. So what are what the uh, so they're going to build a campus? There's going to be a there's a campus. You're going to be there's going to be housing for people. Yeah, about 300 Is units. About 300 uh, housing units. Mostly independent uh, living. Not not that it's actually in set in stone, but the division of it. Well, the business school looked at this and said we could do compared our site to other university sites and what's all around it. They did some analysis that said we could do 600 units. I didn't really understand their analysis, how they got to 600. It didn't make that much sense to me. Uh, and is, so then is KU getting a, a, a KU is going to get a, a get. KU would like to have a building there, uh, a wing of an apartment house, uh, a what? A what, 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 are, what are we? We're just calling it a living laboratory. And it, it may be centralized, it might be decentralized, it, depending on how you want it. The same thing goes for the kinds of services that we have suggested we might want in a community like this. Far be it from me, Rosemary, to even mention CCRC, but I mention it only that those kinds of services that you find in a CCRC might be available here but I don't think it'll be an agglomerated building. It should be a decentralized uh, service um, operation. So will KU get a building? I think KU will get space. It might get part of a building. I don't know whether it'll get a whole building or not. Will there be good parking? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about health, so we're going to ask you to walk, okay? Walk the five miles back and forth, it'll be fine. Right, right. So, so um, it will be independent living, assisted living. It will be uh, a landscape that enhances intergenerational exchange. It will be a landscape that has certainly destinations. It will attempt to um, uh, offer services that will bring people in to use those services, not just people who live there. For example, the hospital is studying a health satellite. But in a health satellite, they might have a pediatrician who would come, or an orthopedic uh, doctor who would come, or uh, nurses who would work there, uh, in order to respond to the needs of younger families. So, Dennis, do I understand then that the land hasn't been purchased or tied up? We're just still talking about a hospital site, huh? Until the university decided that it made a procedural error, the land was going to be purchased tomorrow. That was the last date for it to be purchased, was tomorrow, the 60 acres. Now, it doesn't have to be purchased tomorrow. And a developer isn't going to purchase it yet. Because now there might be other sites that he could purchase. 
So, again, it's these questions that you handle all the time, and it's a risk, and you just play the strongest hand you can. At least that's how I do it. Richard? I don't quite understand the, the university's point of view. If you build a facility, whether it's a, a part of a building or if it's laboratories or space in which various people can carry out research, uh, I, I don't see the problem because the university has the power if somebody who's already here says, oh, I don't want to do research out there, the university can go hire somebody who will do research out there easily enough. The, the provost has that of power. He you can, know, and, uh, I, he can so, but so. I don't think he has those resources. This is no time for him to be spending resources that he doesn't have. And he, believe me, he doesn't have the resources he had in 2005. And he's worried about resources. When you sit across from him, he says to you, you know, the one thing I can't do is build space. I don't have money to build space. I have to raise money for that. And I know you need it. And if somebody will give us the space, then I can pay for the uh, utilities. And if your lab needs certain kinds of laboratory equipment, if we decide that's what we want to do, we can furnish that laboratory space, as long as it has the right infrastructure, for what you need. And I can sort of develop a new approach to research around gerontology and I can compete with MU, for example. We have other things in which we're not going to compete with MU, we're going to work with MU. So, you, yes, he does have that power, but he doesn't have the money to do it, to get put new faculty there, unless he has to reallocate away from pharmacy, which he's not going to do, and he doesn't have the money to build your space, or your space, the decision-making center, he says, but if they build it for me, I can move faculty out there. That's what he said. Now he sees, good idea, but can I move faculty out there? i got to go talk to your dean. And your dean has to say to your chair and with your faculty who supposedly are interested, okay, is that where you're going to do your teaching? Is that where you're going to do your research? Uh, how much time are you going to spend out there? You know, because I have to commit to the provost that you're going to do it. What's, what's the advantage of having the uh, research? Is it out there? I, what would happen if KU said, we're not going to have the research out there, but you can use our logo? I mean, is that is the research itself the draw for the retirees? Nope. No. Okay, so that's, I mean, no. KU can, can no. do it or not. I don't that's know right. That's what, the, that's what the developer says. He says, look, as long as you give me that, I don't care if you come at all. Right. Right. But why would you get that if you weren't going to be there? Right. So. The other thing is, is that why is it that MU has created so much research? From their perspective, it's because they have a real living laboratory and they have lots of participants. I used to call them subjects, but I've been told that that's not right anymore. <laughs> participants. They have lots of participants. And we need participants. That's one of the hardest things that we have to face with our faculty is they can't get enough in, you know, the statistic, to to be able to do a statistical analysis that they can uh, actually make a contribution. Unless you want to study college sophomores, in which case we have lots. We got of lots of college sophomores. And we don't, we don't really have this intergenerational equation going anywhere else in the country, so we're very interested in that generativity between generations that uh, some research suggests that uh, might be really important. Yes. Dennis, I understand that you have many pressing issues, <laughs> and, I, and I say this over and over, I'm going to say it one more time. Our dream, when the uh, aging providers in town were talking about this for years and years, was not more assisted living, more independent living, but rather architectural space where you could bring services in and a person could live until death. And that kind mm -hmm. of architectural space done with universal housing design then yep. is good space for everybody. It's good space for yep. younger people, older people. So every time I hear you say assisted living and independent living, but that know, doesn't obviate that. 
But that doesn't obviate that. Assisted living, if you have an aging in place uh, can be architecture, can in, be serviced, yes. a building that's called assisted living. Well, that's what I said. It's, I didn't say a building. I said decentralized. But somebody, it will have to be some kind of building. They can't just live in a tent. You know <laughs> no, that. But it's, but it's not going to be in a, an agglomerated place. Universal housing design that services. That's right. It's, we don't want it to be an agglomerated, typical CCRC that we see. The first generation that we have here, Presbyterian Manor, and those first generation CCRCs, that's not what we're looking at. We're not even looking at second generation CCRCs. We're looking at decentralized uh, services for people who need assisted living, if they're there, always in a universally designed place, so that they can age in place until they die. So they don't have to move each time they have a, a crisis, that, like my mother. She started with independent living, then she went to assisted living, and now she's in skilled nursing, but she doesn't need skilled nursing. But that's all there is. So, no, you're right. We're, we're right on target with that. We don't foresee it being a single building, like memory care. We expect memory care to be in regular houses scattered throughout this community. I would think that certainly independent living could be in all over, and so could assisted living. Uh, and now skilled nursing is a big issue. Uh, do we really want skilled nursing? It's very regulated, it's very expensive, states don't, are not willing to pay for it anymore, it's sort of against their policy. And we have skilled nursing throughout our community that may be all that's necessary for our community. Maybe we shouldn't offer that service. Although Brandon Woods is cutting their skilled nursing by about a third. So that's an issue. Another issue just to come up with that, and I'm glad to see you here, Debbie, is that I've been meeting with a lot of the, skilled, uh, the senior facilities uh, administrators in Lawrence. I met with them twice and I visited every one of them. Initially, there was pushback. Like, why wouldn't there be pushback? This might be competition. They were worried that somehow we might steal all of their residences. Residents. Really, competition is there, but I don't think that was the real issue. The real issue was that they wanted to be part of this. And I hadn't paid enough attention to them. It's not that I didn't have anything else to do, but I hadn't paid attention to them enough. And once I started meeting with them and talking to them, all of this, wouldn't you say, Debbie, it, it more or less just sort of... I would say 85% has... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to bite my tongue a lot in meetings. Um, yeah. But uh, we just want to make sure that full knowledge mm -hmm. is gained before there's a good stuff. Yeah. So there's a political front out there in Lawrence. There's a political front in KU because there are ideologies in KU. There's administrative issues. Um, there are po politics with the owner of the land, politics with the city and the county, politics with everybody. And so I'm just working through the political aspects of it and as I learn more and more I move it in that direction and now the developer is talking about decentralized services, an old CCRC, but a decentralized service thing. So I don't know what that will look like. It's in flux. That's really for the faculty to determine. Won't look like Tiger Place. No. Tiger Place is a different deal because right. that's for people who are, the range there are is skilled nursing really, 78 to 95. That's a different group of people. No, it's not that. We want to isolate those people. We want this to be a community for all ages, but it's not like Tiger Place. No. Dennis, yeah. I think one of the unique components of, of uh, the campus village is the intergenerational aspect. And mm -hmm. I haven't seen it before. Can you talk how talk about how you're going to incorporate that? Yeah. We had, well, you saw, we had Victor Rainier here last week. And he spent a lot of time talking about design components that enhance intergenerational exchange. I brought up the health uh, satellite. Um, 
we're close to the uh, Rock Chalk Village. So the focus on sports and health and well-being is really important. Um, intergenerational places where people of older generations can come in connection with people with younger generations. Those spaces, pocket parks, places that you have a destination to, and something like this. I don't know if you saw Susie Stadler from Berkeley talked about, she's a kind of a specialist in intergenerational landscape. She said, this is what I did out in Oakland in my front yard. She said, I decided, I'm not gonna mow. I'm gonna build an intergenerational space. So if I said, okay, man, you build me an intergenerational space. You know, what did she do? She said, I'm going to put a ping pong table right in the middle of my yard. I'm going to put benches around. I'm going to put planting things. I'm going to put the ping pong balls and the, the paddles right there. And I'm just going to sit back and see what happens. What happened? Wow! You know, that's the kind of thing that has to go. And that might be the little fishing thing. It might be a garden because it might be a workshop where people of all ages come together. If you do a workshop, uh, I don't love workshops, but a lot of people do. I do love fishing, so I'm ready to teach kids how to fish in our little pond. I'm pretty good at ping pong, too. <laughs> and, you know, it can go on and on, but um, there's some very uh, important ways in order to enhance both planned and unplanned interaction. But you have to have the kinds of amenities that will bring people in. Here's another intergenerational thing. This is what I love. Um, part of this community will have what I call main houses with a dependency. That's, those are architectural terms. So you have a house that's 1,500 square feet, and then you have a connected walkway to a house that's 600 square feet. And I buy I live in the country, so I'm ready to do something. I buy this property, and I live in that house with my wife, and I give that 600, 700 square foot dependency to a graduate student. And part of the deal is that when I need help, I know where I'm coming, and we are going to get to know each other. That's, that's an example of an intergenerational place. Uh, and I think lots of people are interested in that. Because what can happen? Let's say that I do that next year, two years from now. And let's say that five years from now, uh, my wife dies and I'm single. I might switch it. I might go to the 800 square foot and sell or rent that house that I own to you and your new husband and three children. See what I got <laughs> for your future? And I will run it to you for very little, just so I'm connected to you and you know that's one of your responsibilities is this grand friend over here. And I will work with your grandchildren because I'm really connected. And I like children. This is not for everybody. If you don't like children, don't come here. So. You know, I had six grandchildren, and I don't have all of them here. So there's, there are those kinds of connections to enhance intergenerational life, but you have to really look at what do they want. Here's something that I've been talking a lot to, the sandwich generation. I'll be right with you. These are women, mostly, who have three, one, two, or three children. Uh, they're a two-career family, and they're frazzled because the extended family doesn't exist for them anymore. And, you know, I grew up in an intergenerational community. In fact, I think mostly we're intergenerational, except we set aside the really sick and old in care homes. And that's not what we don't want to do. But if you look at where people live who are 65, 75, and 80 in Lawrence, they live all over the place. It's, it's totally scattered everywhere. There doesn't seem to be big concentration. Sometimes 30% of people will live uh, in a, who are older will live in a certain place, but mostly it's scattered. So 
The key is, is to create these amenities. Now, the kinds of architects we're working with have spent a lot of time working on this very problem, like Vic Renier, who's one of the um, uh, members of the uh, Gould Evans, which was one of the finalists. So we're looking for people who already do this and can help us work through these problems. But I think that's a real key question, Aaron, is why do young families want to come here? And they will want to come here only because they need other people. And they can't just be, you know, nuclear family by themselves. Can I, I, we sometimes have a class comes in here oh, at five o'clock, so we're no, going to have to. We're going to. Can I ask a? But just brief. How soon? <laughs> well, will okay, you come up with another procedural uh, well, two, wrinkle? Two years, three years, four years. What do you think? Well, he doesn't know. <laughs> Uh, Not sooner than how many years? I thought we were going to break ground in July until KU came up with this wrinkle. And then it's then it opens when? And then it would the first phase would open a year from then. Okay. And then it would take two more years for the next phase to be developed because that would be more complicated, take longer, dealing with, you know, what is the actual dimension of things and what's the relationship between developer the hospital. D developer, the university. Um, you know. Okay, within our lifetime. It'll <laughs> I, I, the goal. The goal was within five years okay. uh, of 2012. So I would say that we still are in the ballpark of before 2017, and uh, I can't tell. But but everyone's ready. It's just can the university protect itself from the regents? Because the regents were really pissed off about what happened to Rock Chalk Park. Okay. And so that's why we're getting the pushback, you know, okay, we're going to do it differently. Why they didn't do that earlier, I don't know, it just didn't dawn on them, right? Well, this has been really exciting. This has been very interesting as someone who spent his entire career in academic gerontology to suddenly, at this stage, be talking about real estates and understanding the difference between an MOI and an MOU. Uh, and an MYU and, uh, and an M-I-C-K-E-Y. Yes. Well, thank you, Dennis. Sure.